Hey, it's good to have you here this morning, and uh, trust that you're enjoying this moment. By the way, only two more months, only two more months. In two more months, we will get to Labor Day. I live for that moment, the Sunday following Labor Day. Uh, If you haven't figured out, I despise summer. I don't like Memorial Day between Memorial and, and Labor Day. I do like the cooler weather, so thank the Lord for that. It is a good thing. And uh, by the way, too, starting tomorrow is our amazing soccer camp. And I believe we have 59 kids signed up. Is that right, Susan? 59 kids, more than last year. We're jazzed about that. So please be in prayer. Uh, Confident God's going to do some amazing things through the uh, interaction, through the preaching of the gospel, through just the, the excellence that Matt and company brings to that. So thank you again, Matt. For making this happen. We're so excited about just that unconventional uh, VBS and Vacation Bible School. It's just an amazing time for us to have this team play. And thank you, Bridgeway Ites, for making it happen. It's also good to have Reginald with us. I got to meet Reginald. He said, this is my first time in church. How old are you, Reginald? Eight years old? You're seven years old. Well, welcome to Bridgeway. We're so happy to hear for the first time in church. That's awesome. And uh, we we love love church. We love people coming to check out what God's doing at Bridgeway. It's also great to have uh, Aaron's parents with us. And you'll get to meet him in a formal way in a few minutes after the sermon. But uh, it's great to have, uh, I don't know, obviously he was a chaplain retired. He's a reverend. He, uh, He has his bride. They've raised their kid the right way. We're so thrilled that we have Again, Aaron on, on the team, and we're so happy that the Laxes are here, Doug and his bride, and they're having good grandparent time, and you'll get to hear him at the end as he prays and closes us out. But uh, we're glad you're here, and want to make sure that we are just really clear, thinking about this issue of warfare. It was June 1944. And it was 24-hour delayed because of the weather, and this was D-Day. This was the moment that we had been anticipating. It was preceded by aerial bombardments that took out the uh, coastal defenses. 13,000 paratroopers, 5,000 ships in the area, 156,000 soldiers coming together on the beaches of Normandy to take out the Third Reich. It was an epic day. It was, it was a day that, that was uh, prepped for for so many months. And it was, again, the champion of this day was the General Eisenhower that we all know and love. It's now a famous letter. You can Google it. You can find it. It was a, a letter that he sent out before this moment. It was entitled to the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. And he said something that was profound. I mean, look at the words as he's prepping these, all these people, that soldiers, sailors, and airmen of this force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. He goes on to talk about the fact that you're, as they were going to this moment, that it was about the elimination in the letter of the Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe and security for ourselves in the free world. And he did did not want them to be um, ill-advised. He wanted them to go into this war with total clarity. And he said that your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened, and he will fight savagely. And so as the troops received those letters and as they were prepping for this moment, it was a moment that, again, the world will no, never soon forget. It was costly. And it, it was a, a battle that required so much, but yet together the world saw the, the fell, the falling of evil. This morning we continue our journey in seeking to understand this idea of warfare. And as we do, I want us to, I want us to think about this issue of armor. We want our people in this church to get dressed. That's an obvious given, Right? Uh, Bridgeway, we don't care what you wear as long as you wear. That's important, right? You've got to wear something. But you have to get dressed before you get dressed. When you get up in the morning, we all pick our, our statements, right? If your little people are, are they're learning how to dress themselves, it's kind of fun to watch what they bring, uh, what they put on, because n- normally it doesn't match. 
Leah likes to put on alternate stock colors. I guess that's a thing. And it's, it's just a statement that we have as, we, as kids get dressed. But I ask you, did you get dressed this morning? When you had your first thoughts and you were waking up and you're laying in bed deciding, do I hit the snooze, do I get up? Were you thinking about the armor of God? Let me just give you a, a, a little overview for those who are not with us because we want to make sure we are clear about this battle. We began the series, uh, this mini-series, this interruption into the story of Ephesians by looking at C.S. Lewis. And remember the paraphrase? Basically, he said that there's two extremes you can go to. You can pretend that the spirit world cannot hurt you. If you make that mistake, if you conclude that the spirit world is not dangerous to you because it's spirit, it's not physical, you have, again, fallen into the hands of the enemy. And if you feel an excessive, unhealthy interest, Lewis goes on to say, then again, you, he has you where he wants you because a spirit of fear will no doubt dominate your heart. And so as we look at the armor of God, we've looked at four pieces. We know that he has no less goal than the destruction of God's people. He wants to take you down. He wants to take me down. And so God says we should put on the whole armor of God. He doesn't say pick your favorite. He doesn't say that it's just a, it's a, it's an optional thing. No, he brings commands that are non-optional, non-negotiable, aimed right at our will. And they're perpetual commands that should go on every day that when we get up, we put on this complete panoply of God, this protective armor that will guide us and protect us and put up this hedge of protection. Scriptures are replete with reminders that if we say that there is no devil, if we say that there is no harm to us, we don't read the same Bible. Over a hundred times the Bible talks about Satan and his uh, ability to pounce. Peter reminds us that he walks about like a roaring lion. And so as we come, we remind ourselves that the one who's in us is greater than the one who is against us. John is clear. But look at those pieces. We previously talked about the belt of truth. Remember what we said? That that was a central part of a person who's committed to integrity. That I am the same in public that I am in private. That I'm committed to truthfulness in my life. That it's not so much the, it's not the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's, that's objective truth. It is me putting on a truthfulness to my story that as I walk through life and as I do work, I am an, an integrity person. I have wholeness to my life. We also talked about this breastplate of righteousness, that I am wrapped. I am wrapped in this bulletproof vest of God. I have his righteousness. It was not something I could earn. Luther reminds us that it's a righteousness of another, capital A. It's Jesus who's now made me worth himself to the Father. And now that I have this righteousness, it is a bulletproof vest because the enemy has to go through the righteousness of Christ that's wrapped me, and it's a crazy thing. I didn't have to merit it. I didn't have to earn it. I couldn't perform to ever impress God. He's impressed because of the work of that other, other person, that is Jesus. And so as I get up in the morning, I have to remind myself that the Father is pleased. You couldn't impress him. And the crazy thing is, we'll get to this today, that you can't make God stop loving you. He can't love you anymore. He can't love you any less. That It's a constant love. Nothing can separate us from that love of God. And so as we go through the battlefield of life, we have to make sure that we're very clear. Thirdly, the feet, the gospel shoes of peace. And, and that's kind of a, some people think that it's about taking the gospel. It's not that. It's basically the declaration that God has signed a peace treaty. Again, in the blood, it's inked in the blood of Christ. And now I have this amazing ability to walk through life, not wondering, are God and I on the same team? No, we completely are. I am now an ally with the Father vertically because of what Jesus has done for me. I am his child. And I have peace with God, therefore I can have the peace of God. Remember that? Vertically flows in the horizontal. And so, if I believe the writings, I should go to bed, I should get up, reminding myself that I will forever be a friend of God. Nothing will change that. That's crazy. There's no performance. It's, it's, it's the messiness of grace, and it's, it's totally of God. It's not of me. That's critical, again, because the Bible makes it clear. There's nothing you could do 
There's nothing I could do to contribute toward my salvation. It's a complete act of God's grace to me. I receive it, and I bask in this illogical love and this extravagant grace. And so I have this amazing ability to have peace. And then this idea, again, goes further because we should be the kinds of people who have a shield of faith. Remember that? Shield of faith is a shield that extinguishes every arrow, every missile of the enemy, that it, it sinks in when it hits, and this shield, again, of dependence on God shows me that I'm leaning on those everlasting arms, not on myself. That faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It was the way I got into the family of God, and it's the way I'm supposed to live my life, because as you receive Christ, Jesus the Lord, you're supposed to walk in him. And that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And so as I live in a sense of dependence throughout my day, I have this amazing awareness that God is there. So, I don't know why this thing is going crazy on me. There we go. Finally, helmet of salvation. This morning, we want to talk about this helmet of salvation and make sure that we are abundantly clear. What is the helmet of salvation? I mean, is it just... Is it just a cutesy Sunday school story? We've talked about this, that you put a flannel graph on a, a board. And I understand that we still use flannel graph at Bridgeway. I've learned that, that it's not dated. It's still going forth. By the way, please continue to think about what uh, Brittany said. We're excited about the fall and uh, Alice and Brittany together. Um, they're kind of like Batman and Robin. Is that a good way to... Maybe that's not good. That's a male dominance. Uh, Bat... Batgirl, not Batgirl, let's say Supergirl and like Wonder Woman. Is that good? Okay, so you two together, you're working to advance the cause of discipleship and catechism and our kids being like Christ. Very excited about what's going to happen as they continue to push our kids. But let's talk about this idea. And there's a principle that if you learn nothing else, and before your morning nap, please embrace this. Think about this. This is, this is so critical. This is what we mean when we think of this helmet of salvation. It's something that's supposed to be in place and you're supposed to think this way, that the assurance of my salvation, of yours, it's our impenetrable defense. You can't get beyond it. It's impenetrable against anything that the enemy throws my way. And so this morning, let's, let's unpack this because I really want us to think like a soldier this morning. I think the point is about our thinking the helmet of salvation is what we are focused on. And if we don't get this clear, we are going to be susceptible to the enemy's attacks. And so what you think is critical. You are what you think. We're a product of our hungers. What I think, in fact, the Bible says in the old translation, as a person thinks, so are they. And so we have to make sure that we're thinking good thoughts. What kind of thoughts was the Apostle Paul thinking as he was, again, joined at the hip, as it were, with these Roman soldiers that were guarding him under house arrest. When he looked at their armor, this is where the metaphor came from. It was practical. And he said, well, this, this is a great metaphor. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground, as Wearsby says. And so as we think about this thinking like a Christian, thinking like a warrior, let's talk about this, the helmets. So you had two options back in the day. You had a leather helmet option that the Romans could use. And again, it was protective to a degree. And it had the side flaps to protect your jaw, but it was not the ultimate protection. The ultimate protection was, of course, the one that we most often think of. It was made out of bronze or brass. Uh, it, it would deflect a pretty good blow from the ramphia, the, the sword that was being swung, that four-foot sword throughout the battlefield. You wanted this helmet in place if you took a hit to the head. I'd rather have a ding and a dent in my helmet, right, than taking a hit. You know how critical the helmet is. And so even in, back in Roman times, you knew the, the rank of an officer by looking at the plume on top. It was more ornamental for the more high-ranked ones, the ones that are just the grunts, that did all the hard work. They usually did not have that. But they had the best helmets in the world. What's the point of a helmet? Think about it. In Pennsylvania, you do not have to wear a helmet if you're a motorcyclist. It's not a good idea. It's a very bad idea. Why, why is it protected? Why is it important? Because it protects your noggin. It protects that so that your brain, your scrambled brains are not all over the tarmac, right? You want to keep that in place. 
the, the accident we talked about last week. That man did not have a helmet on. And so when the car drifted right into his lane in front of us, he was bleeding pretty significantly because he went down hard and had a head trauma. The helmet is supposed to protect you. If you're a football player, if your kids play football, they have a helmet in for a reason. Why? Again, we don't want that important thing called your brain to be impacted. If you're a cyclist, you wear those, again, so that you can be protected. Construction workers, on it goes. Helmets, hard hats, they are a key thing to protect you. And so, as we think about this, this helmet, and as we look at it, and we say, okay, what is it supposed to be doing? Obviously, the idea of deflecting arrows and the idea of protecting from concussion. How does this work in our practical life. And so as we think about this, it is a battle for the mind. It's a critical battle. This world is after your mind. This world wants to to disciple you. It wants to spin things. It wants to change the way you think about things. And it's doing a very good job. We think of the discipleship box of the of the world, it's, it's TV, it's, it's cable, and it's a, it's a 24-hour perpetual um, commercial for the things that typically are most often against God's way. And so as a disciple of Christ, uh, we, we come and we listen and we learn. We, we, we try to make sense of this Christian moment, and we try to make sure that we're thinking Christianly and living biblically. So what's our option when it comes to Things like that. Is it wrong for a person to watch TV? Of course not. Absolutely not. And again, to say otherwise is to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to learn to think. I think I've mentioned before, when I first came here many moons ago, Susan and I had not had a TV for seven years in our story. Uh, And they were a little concerned about that because is this guy a legalist? I mean, he doesn't have a TV. Why doesn't he have a TV? Well, for us, it was a challenge from our premarital mentor, uh, a one-year challenge. Just give up TV for one year, your first year of marriage. And I, to me, that was like asking me to cut off my arm. I love TV. I, I grew up on Gilligan's Island and, and the Brady Bunch and, and Dark Shadows, well, when I could sneak that in under my parents' radar. But those are the moments that I, I, I love TV. But TV, TV is a, a time and a place where things can be thrown your way, false ideas that if we don't test them, if we don't benchmark them against the truth, we may be buying into a lie and we don't even know it. How do you know when you're deceived? Isn't that the point? You don't know when you're deceived. Deception is something that reigns. And so the better you know the genuine article, that's why we're, we push quiet time and journaling and, and being a, a biblicist, that you're biblically engaged and, and make sure that we're constantly in the book because we want to make sure that we're thinking God's thoughts. See, in this moment, the Christian has this piece of armor and it's from God and it helps us in an amazing way. So what is a proper way to think about this thing of the battle, the armor of God and the helmet of salvation? What is he talking about, salvation? Well, there's three things typically that theologians think of when they think about salvation. And again, without apology, I want to push you to think a little theological for a minute because I think if we have clear thinking, it results in clear living, right? You know the words, orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy, uh, ortho, ortho, straight. So if you have straight teeth, orthodontics, right? Orthopraxy or, excuse me, orthodoxy, straight thinking leads to orthopraxy, which is straight living, right living. And so we need to think about this thing of the Christian life. So if we're looking at the idea of salvation, notice on the left, the first kind of salvation, the upper left corner, justification. There is a clear sense when you think about your story, if you're God's kid, and I remind you, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, people who have already settled the issue of, am I right with God? The gospel was clear to them. They knew, I'm a sinner. Sinners need a savior. They had invited Christ to become the savior, Lord of their life. So in a past tense sense, they were saved, past tense. We call that justification. It's a fancy term. It's in the Bible, some of the Bibles, if you have the right translation. And and it, it means that God's declared you righteous. It wasn't something you could earn. He totally gifted it to you apart from merit. An amazing act of God's grace. 
But then if you look in the middle section, there's another word. It's, it's the fact that you are being saved. It's a present tense thing, not past. And it's that fancy word for sanctification. Sanctification is being set apart for God's purpose and its use. Sanctification is something that I have everything to do with. I had nothing to do with my justification, but now I'm being sanctified. That means when I make a choice, a holy sweat choice to go to the gym, okay, that's a choice, right? You, you're the product of your choices. When I make a holy sweat decision to come into the book and have a biblical workout, I am deciding to say, okay, I'm giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to groom me and grow me. And you can't. You can't think like a soldier. I can't think like a soldier apart from this book. And so to have one feeding a week, if you're depending on myself to feed, or Pastor Aaron or others, or Pastor Dave, uh, Glarum, if you're depending on us, you're going to be emaciated. You're not going to be strong in the Christian life. You need to send down deep theological roots on your own, and that is your responsibility. I said it before, I can't do it for you. But we like to think that way. We're in a, a fast culture. We love to think about fast things. We love to pretend that there's a diet, and if you get this particular pill, and you buy into this pill, you don't even have to go to the gym. It just changes everything. Just a simple little pill. It's so amazing. And it's a money-back guarantee. You just do this. You see. You'll see. It just, it'll make you look like the pictures they try to peddle on their advertisements. And so the idea is that there's nothing you have to do, and that's not true. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible says that, again, sanctification is ultimately best expressed physically. Paul said to the Thessalonians, this is your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So really, sanctification is the best way it's expressed is physically. So we know we're being sanctified when we are physically controlling ourselves and resisting desires that are against the moral revealed will of God. And so that middle section is a critical piece. It starts the moment you come to Christ. For me, it was 1967, and it will continue until the day I, I die, walk off this planet. I'm carried off this planet. In that moment, we must aggressively work to grow up in Jesus. So you, you come and you worship. You, um, you go ahead and you continue to read Christian literature. You pray. You hang out with God's people. And all these things are part of God's uh, his gym. It's like God's gym. He puts you in a place where you're set apart for God's purpose in you. So the, the helmet of salvation could mean not just justification, I have been saved. Not just sanctification, I am being saved. But there's a third part to that. There's a third dimension, a tense. It's, it's the future tense. Someday I will be saved. And so that's what we call glorification. Glorification is, is the day that I, I, I'm off this planet, my heart has stopped, the rapture has occurred, or however I, I exit, and I'm immediately in the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the body present with the Lord. At that moment, I am, I am glorified, and my sin nature is taken out, and I am forever with the Lord. And, and now, now I have this amazing ability. I am not tainted. I'm no longer struggling. The, the sanctification thing is a holy sweat struggle, but glorification is when the very presence of sin is gone. So justification, you're saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, you have ability over the power of sin in your life as you depend on the Spirit. Glorification is the very presence of sin. It's yanked out of me because of God's kindness and His grace. So the question is, in this moment, which is he referring to? This is a helmet of salvation. And which one is better for the battle that we engage in every day? Which is better? I'm going to argue all three. So, Satan loves to take Christians and make them doubt that they're really God's kid. And what a paralysis he can bring into our story if I'm perpetually wondering, am I really his child? And I'm, I'm, I know that this is one of the things that we're really passionate about in this post-Sunday school world where kids are not growing up with the learnings of God and getting the vocabulary of God talk, that they're not learning the books of the Bible and they're not learning some basic doctrine. It's so vital, it's critical that we explain those things 
to them, that they get it for themselves, that the gospel is something that they internalize and they interiorize and it becomes who they are. And so this is the helmet of salvation. Think about it. We've talked about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. We've talked about the shield of faith. We've talked about the shoes of peace, the war shoes. This is the fifth piece. And if those other defenses fail, you got the helmet of salvation. You don't want somebody to get that close to you because this is now mortal combat. It's hand-to-hand combat. This is where Satan really does some of his best work. He comes to us and he injects a thought, just a thought. And it's a little subtle thought and it's designed to unravel your confidence in this amazing God that we have been blessed to know that now we're on a first name basis with him and so satan starts to erode your confidence did you really mean that when you said yes to jesus at that five-day club or wanna uh when you crossed the line when you went up maybe on an altar call was that legit did it really happen we need to talk more about that and we will in a few moments but the point is the point is that god wants you to think about this whole idea of salvation. The assurance of our salvation is an impenetrable defense against anything the enemy can throw at us. It's called the doctrine of eternal security. That's a fact, but the the personalization and the subjective feel of that is called the assurance of salvation. If you understand the eternal security, the consequence of that is that you have this assurance that's internal and, and it's peace that's beyond description It's the helmet of salvation that we're talking about here. If you're a historian, you may know that as historians look back at the Roman Empire and talked about the demise of the Roman Empire, one of the things that they pointed to for one of the key reasons why this empire fell was this, because the the soldiers began to have a disuse of exercise. Interesting. They started to get soft. They were the big bad Roman Empire and they did not spend as much time doing the physical activities that they did. That's important. And because of that, the fatigue came in a lot quicker. One of the things related to fatigue is they were starting to fatigue. They started to argue with their commanding officers saying that there's something we should do without. And they said, do we really need to take our helmet into battle? And so they got some of the key leaders of these brigades to say that you do not have to bring your helmet. And some historians say that one of the things that helped bring down the Roman Empire was that they left their helmets as an option to the gear that their soldiers used. Isn't that interesting? That's profound to me that the church cannot afford, we cannot afford to lay aside any of these pieces, especially what you think. It's a battle for the mind. Satan is after your thinking and he wants to, he wants to, Uh, again, completely persuade us of something different. If you've ever taken the time to be on Bridgeway, bccyork.com, and look at our beliefs, we believe the seventh point is eternal security, that our salvation is forever. That's a critical doctrine. Why, Why do we make such a beef about it? And again, I'm not saying every doctrine is equally critical. I, I am not that guy. Please understand it. I, I understand that there's some things that do not matter, and we don't, ma- we don't focus on those things. Sometimes the church is known for what it's against versus what they're for. Sometimes churches become all about us, the, the rules and regs talk, and you know, the lists, and I, I, I grew up in that church. I, I understand that. But one of the key, key pieces is this idea of thinking. Thinking Christianly, living biblically, And the Bible is replete. We could go to many, many passages. I'll just turn to one real quick. If you have your copy of your droid iPhone paper copy, look at 1 John 5 for a minute. When I was a kid, I was forced to memorize this passage in Awana. Look at 1 John 5, 11. It's an amazing passage. It teaches just one of countless examples. And if you look at this, I mean, this passage has helped a lot of people think about this whole idea of assurance of salvation. Look what it says, verse 11. And this is the testimony. This is John the Apostle, the one Christ loved, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not life. I write these things to you, 13, 
who believe in the name of the Son of God, here it is, purpose clause, that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay. What has God given us? Ask some questions. Let's do some Bible study here. What has God given us here? Eternal life. What did you have to do to get this eternal life? Believe. No contribution on your own. Who has eternal life? Every person who believes. How do you lose eternal life? Does it tell us? It says it's eternal life. Think of the classic John 3.16 that we all maybe have learned that for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Interesting. Why do we have this eternal life? Because somebody died for us. They paid the price and died the sinner's death that he did not deserve. Is there any alternative to believing or what's a better way to perceive this Well, again, the right correction and view of this as you lend this, this has been written to give us hope about the future. And so if you think about, again, the three tenses, I I love the future tense salvation. Uh, In fact, if you go to Thessalonians, I believe it's chapter 5, verse 8, it talks about the hope of the helmet of salvation. It gives me hope. If you think about the finish line, it gives you hope. For those who are runners, you know how you, you may not be having your best race. Maybe it's, it's just a, a very difficult, hot run, or whatever you're into. And to keep the finish line in mind is so important. Steve Covey reminded us that we should always begin with the end in mind. And so as a Christian, keep that in mind. Yeah, it's tough slogging right now. It's, it's a war. I'm in a war every day. But someday it's going to end, and I will not have to do this anymore. That's in the lofty by and by. But right now, we're in the nasty now and now. And this is messy, and it's complicated. And so, is God making a promise? You bet you. Would God lie to us? No. Have you received the Son of God personally? If it's a yes, then you have eternal life. I'm going to prove that in a few moments further. But as we think about this, I I, I believe it relates to this. Remember the San Francisco Bridge? And the building of it. Maybe you don't realize or remember that initially it went crazy slow. Very slow. Why? Because 12 people died. That's not a good thing. They were working on this bridge and before they installed these nets, there was such fear as another one bit the dust and went to Davy Jones' lockers, they fell to their death in this cold, watery grave because of terminal velocity in some cases. It just made people work hesitantly, slow, and they could not achieve, that. they didn't stay on pace to the schedule that the, the, the engineers had made for this. And so as they thought about this long and hard, they thought, well, let's, what's one simple way we can bring change? We're going to give these guys a safety net. And so from shore to shore, they installed these safety nets. Guess how many people fell after they installed the safety net? Well, two. Two more fell. What happened to them? Nada. They did not die because the the net caught them. But guess what happened to the productivity of the team? They actually caught up and they finished in record time and won. Why is that? Because they had this sense of confidence and security that as they were going about, they had this real sense that, you know what, their safety and the, the assurance that if they fell, they would be caught made all the difference in the world. I want you, I want you to believe in eternal security. And I I know that the devil loves to mess with people and on this, so I wanna I wanna go to talk through really three questions that relate to this. Let's talk about how to combat doubts with this helmet of salvation. This is what we must believe. Why does Bridgeway believe in eternal security? And let me finish just making application to this. Why in the world does this doctrine of the helmet of salvation, why why is it so important? And and why, again, do we say this is a critical belief that it's the seventh in our creedal doctrinal statement? The Bible teaches it, okay? Is that that a, a really profound point? That the blessings of salvation cannot be lost because it's the nature of salvation. How do we know that? I could put you all to sleep right now and we could go through a very tedious Bible study. I have right in front of me now over 200 verses I'm looking at. We don't have time for that. 
Let me give you a hang glide trip. So fasten the seatbelt and listen. Salvation is eternal. John 3.16, I said it. Eternal life. Not, not life until you mess up. It's eternal life. It's presented as a present self, a possession. If you look in like 1 John 3, now we are the children of God. It does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he does, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. You're in Christ. One of the key languages of Ephesians in chapter 1. You're in Christ. So if I mess up, does God take me out of Christ? If I'm justified, that is declared righteous. Does God undeclare me un- unrighteous? Does he make me back guilty again? Am I de-justified, if that's even a word? It's positional. It's not based on merit. So, so salvation is a critical piece that God wants us to understand. But as you think about, again, these, the language of what God is saying... He wants you and me to understand that if you look into the scriptures, that the the Bible is replete, that we must have this thinking clear in our minds. And so the assurance that if you fall, they were caught. That was what guided the building in that. Salvation. Please hear this. Why do we believe in this at Bridgeway? Here's why. Because the salvation blessings cannot be lost because of the results of salvation. What's that mean? Eternal life, I've already said it, justification, peace with God. So, so the shoes of peace, I have peace with God. It says 5.1, I think it's Romans. Because we, we're justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So now I'm no longer an, a friend of God. I become a God defriends me, you know, like a heavenly defriending on Facebook. Is that what happens when I mess up? Is that how it works? No. It's a sure possession. And so when the Bible talks about the hope of the future, it's not like a hope so maybe. No, we have the blessed hope. And it's not a hope I'm going to get to heaven someday and I have this pan scale of good and bad. No, that's not what the Bible says. It's all spiritual blessings I have in Christ Jesus. We know that we pass from death to life because we love the brothers. So if you've passed from death to life, when I sin and get out of fellowship with God, I go from life back to death? Really? You see, there's just a great misunderstanding. There's sin that all of us struggle with. Uh, we talked about one particular person who came here one time and tried to tell us, convince us that he had not sinned in 10 years. 10 years. Not one sin. And, and he wanted to get up and preach a sermon to everybody to give them hope that they could be like him, I guess, basically. That you too can be sin-free we had a heart-to-heart afterwards. And I love what it says in 1 John 1, 7. The person who says they don't, don't sin is a liar. And the truth isn't in them. You see, we are going to struggle. And these blessings cannot be lost. Here's another reason. And this will make some of you uncomfortable. The blessings of salvation cannot be lost because of the teaching of election. You say, what in the world? Really? Yes, election. Election does not destroy human responsibility. Did you hear me? You have to do something in your Christian life. I get it. You need to work out your salvation. That's holy sweat. But election promises the security of the believer. I love that. That the people he has chosen are going to be there in eternity. And he doesn't unchoose people. Before the foundation of the world, he selected. That's the teaching of the Bible. That they're electos. And you don't become unelected just because you struggle. Welcome to the life we call the Christian life. It's a struggle. It's a journey. The blessings of salvation cannot be locked because of, lost because of lack of good works. And I'm going to talk about that in a few moments. You're saying that you don't have to perform to keep your relationship with God? No. You could not perform to impress heaven and somehow uh, curry favor with God. You can't do that. You can't perform. There's nothing you could ever do. If we could do something that would somehow impress God to give us this gift, then why in the world did Jesus come? You couldn't merit it. You couldn't earn it. I couldn't do that. But I will say, a lack of performance should make you take notice. And a lack of performance and a life full of good works certainly will deny you of reward. And, and if fruitfulness is not abundant in your life, you should ask yourself the question. Maybe no fruit means no root. Clearly, the Bible is talking about something that we should think about. The blessings of salvation cannot be lost because of our union with Christ. All right, 
Secondly, second question, is profession the same as possession? Okay, helmet of salvation. We're supposed to think about our relationship with God in a new way because now I'm his kid and I have him in my life and it's supposed to change everything. Does it mean that a person, again, anybody who professes that they are God's kid is necessarily God's kid? Remember the moment we look in the Gospels that people come before the Father and he says, hey, I've done this and I've done that. And he says, hey, depart from me. I have never known you. So I, I, I don't want to give false security. If a person has said, I came to Jesus in a five-day club, and yet you look at their life, and for the past 30, 40 years, they lived like a hellion from Helm. You know, if they, if they live like that, just not living, uh, no godliness, no fruit, what right do you have to claim that you're God's kid if there's no production of fruit? The Bible's pretty clear. Get, look, look at some of the thinkings that are giveaway that I'm God's kid. I know I've passed from death to life. I love the brothers. Uh, God's word is, is a thing I love, John 15, that I abide in his word, and his word abides in me, that I don't forsake the assembling of, of ourselves together. We come together, first, or Hebrews 11, ta- or 10 talks about, 25, that we come together with God's people and we grow. There's an increasing Christ likeness about my life but if I'm not showing any of that is profession the same as possession no just because you say it doesn't mean it's so you're saying but Dave you're making me uncomfortable okay good we don't want you to be comfortable all the time when we come here I must be a person who backs up my my talk with my walk and the Bible is is very very clear on this so salvation demands repentance, period. It's because of God's kindness that leads me to repentance. And so repentance is that that change, that metanoeo, I go a different way, a U-turn in my life. I was this, but now I'm this. Remember Corinthians, the, the most unhealthy church in the Bible, the Corinthian church, the Corinthian catastrophe. He, he talks about, you know, people were adulterers and idolaters and they were lovers of other people, men with men, women with women. He says, but such were some of you. He talked about the change that came, the before after. We're supposed to be different. Helmet of salvation says, I can have assurance by looking at the production of my life. If I have fruit coming out of my life, that is a good indicator that the the life of God is resonant. It's consuming me. It's growing me in Christ's likeness. And so it requires a new birth. And a new birth changes your life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anybody's in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And so enough of this easy believism, Bonhoeffer was right, cheap grace is simply that. It's not grace. It's a costly grace. And when Christ called us, he called us to come and die, and he called us to give up, again, the things that are most important to us. If anybody would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's not an easy believism. Man, that's a, that's a call to abandoning myself and saying yes to God and no to myself. That's no easy believism. Salvation is evidenced by perseverance. I so believe that. The Bible says that they went out from among us because they are not of us, Corinthians, 1 John 2. And so you, there is a perseverance of the saints that you persevere and you continue. You're not like on again, off again, more off than on. Saving faith produces works. James says, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You have to produce. I have to produce. If I'm not producing, it's saying something about the life or lack of life in me. And then finally, finally, this idea of does the doctrine of eternal security encourage reckless living? Does it encourage reckless living? No. And I, when I go to, by the way, I just a good chance to throw this out. This week I'm going for residency, so I will not be available this week. If you have any questions, contact Pastor Aaron. He will be glad to solve all your problems. Uh, I will be in, in residency over at Lancaster, so it's a nice, easy commute at home. I have a good chance to be home at night. Looking forward to it. I'm six weeks from being done my classwork for this doctorate. That's a good thing. 
But I have guys in my, my program that they believe that you can lose your salvation and that my, it's reckless to suggest that once saved, always saved, and because it encourages a, an abandonment to yourself. No, no, it's not what the Bible says. Belief in my security with my relationship with God is the freedom to live as I ought, not as I want. When God has takes, staked out claim on my life, he calls me to come and follow him. That is the point. And so this is the safety, again, the safety of the awareness that those builders of the bridge, they knew that when they messed up, and you're going to mess up sometimes, God catches you when you sin, when I sin. It's because we still have a sin nature. You're going to mess up. I love the doctrine of eternal security that I'm not on a performance trap or a treadmill of God and I have to keep performing to maintain my salvation. You couldn't earn it. You can't maintain it. It's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works. So you can't brag and boast. So God loves me even still. So what does that look like? It looks like this. April 9th, 1865, Robert E. Lee met with General Ulysses S. Grant to sign the official ending of the Civil War. And as this rendition of an artist reminds us that that's, they signed the ending of this collision of our nation in that moment. But here's the problem. If you know your Civil War history, I know some of you do, it was 16 months 16 months until the war was really completely over. And for 16 months, there were skirmishing and fightings that were going on, especially again in the South. It wasn't until August of 80, 1866 that President Andrew Johnson declared a formal end to the war. Why? Because there are people that didn't respect that that peace treaty that was signed. There was still a cleanup operation, a mopping up operation that had to go down, and President Jefferson Davis of the Confederate ordered General Johnson to keep fighting. He didn't, he didn't acknowledge it. The war was over, but he did not act like it. I love that reminder. If you're God's kid, if you've come to Christ, you're supposed to think like a soldier. You're supposed to, to have this real sense of, okay, the battle has been won, we know we've, the rest of the story that, that someday I'm not going to struggle anymore. In the interim, in the nasty by and by, right now, I must work out my salvation with fear and trembling, holy sweat leaning on the Spirit of God. I can choose to make God smile this week versus not. That I'm the kind of the disciple that again understands that it's about Him. This assurance of salvation brings such a security and it's an impenetrable defense against anything the enemy will throw at me. So is your, your salvation secure? Absolutely, positively, irrevocably, yes. You're secure. Now we live like it. We make the Father look good. You never, never make the Father look better than when you're thinking like a soldier. That's the separation between the men and the boys, the women and the girls, I guess. You have to think like a soldier. A soldier is singular in their focus. A soldier is a person who again keeps the, the prize and the end in mind and they're a person that says, I get it, I'm God's kid and I'm, gonna, I'm in a battlefield and I have to be ready at a moment's notice to be ready for the enemy's assaults. The war's over. Satan knows he's a defeated foe, I, I'm convinced. But in the skirmishes of this week, let's make sure that we put in place this helmet of salvation and that we live like a soldier and we think like a soldier because that's, what God has called us to. This is our privilege. We know what we need to wear for the war. Are you getting dressed for battle? Let's pray. And so God, I thank you for, thank you for your holy writ. Thank you for the truth that you give us. Thank you that it, it challenges us, God. That even though we're in this life, it's still, there's so much more to do in growing in grace and in the personal knowledge of Jesus I thank you, God, that you've not left us to our own devices, that you've given us armor, a full panoply of God, an armor of God that you want us to wear. I pray, God, that we would never think about going into the balance of this new week without the helmet of salvation firmly in place. Help us to detect the, 
the fallacious ideas, the heterodoxy of Satan as he would attack us this week. Help us to lean hard upon your truth and, and put holy sweat behind picking up your word and applying it to, the, to this week so that we can be your kind of people that make you look good. We ask this in your strong name. Amen.